Good morning, good morning, good morning. If you are in our time zone, good afternoon or good evening in a different time zone. My name is Morris Mtombeni and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the first Gibbs Flash Forum of 2021 that I am hosting. It is a true privilege that we kick off today with two amazing South Africans. I'm gonna call them South Africans because I consider them South Africans. One is not quite South African anymore, but he truly is forever South African at heart. Um, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to be regaled, engaged, and I suppose encouraged to discover something of ourselves as we discover something in their lives. So allow me to introduce to you to a colleague and friend, Peter Hain, who was born in South Africa. And um, I think his formative years, his roots are grounded in South Africa. And as an alumni of Pretoria, let me put it that way, the city of Pretoria, particularly Pretoria Boys High, which is across the road um, from the University of Pretoria, our main campus university, I'm so happy he's come home and he's now an, an adjunct faculty member of the Gordon Institute of Business Science. And he's had an illustrious career um, as a politician, um, previously member of parliament, cabinet minister, and now member of the House of Lords, Lord Peter Hain. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, Morris. Great to be with you. Excellent. And then one of my old crushes, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, we are, how can I say, uh, in a world where you can express yourself freely now and uh, people won't judge you intellectually at the very least, one of my crushes that I've always wanted to meet. And through Peter, I'm so grateful that I finally get to meet Andre Odendahl, um, a scholar, a historian, a lover of sports, um, and of course, a former first class cricketer and anti-apartheid activist. Of course, both Peter and Andre are anti-apartheid act activists, but I think they continue to be activists because as they say, we're not yet Uhuru. Welcome, Andre. Thanks very much, Morris. And um, anyone who I uh, meet for the first time and says they've read the founders uh, straight away has to be my friend. So thanks very much for having me this morning. Well, Andre, anyone who has been gotten an MBA at Gibbs uh, since 2014 to date uh, uh, will know the work that I, I refer to quite a lot in our environment of business course. And uh, certainly between your work as well as Mel Lipton's work, um, you, you have helped to reshape uh, now over a thousand MBA graduates that we've had over the past mm -hmm. few years. So allow me to say why we're here today we, you, we are brought here today because of this amazing contribution that you both, you gentlemen, have given to us. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a book called Pitch, Sport, Racism, and the Resistance. So let me kick off with a man um, with, known by many names. Uh, he was called an anarchist and a communist, a demo king, uh, and, 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 and not to uh, ignore the contradiction, Dutchman, uh, drug taker, um, bank robber, and unpleasant little creep. <laughs> I mean, I thought I had a rough life, <laughs> Peter, but uh, of course, the biggest of them all for me is Führer Hain. And this was before you turned 20, Peter. <laughs> so ha, what did you do to deserve such affection, if I can put it in a kind way, Peter? Well, thank you, Morris. I, it, it arose and happened because I was 19 at the time and the Springboks, the all white Springboks were due to tour Britain in 1969-70, the height of direct action and demonstrations in Western Europe and the USA. And I came up with the idea of disrupting them, running on the pitch at Twickenham and Murrayfield and uh, Cardiff Arms Park right across the country 
and found myself unexpectedly leading that campaign. And we used nonviolent direct action by running on the pitch, laying siege to the team's hotel, and that caused absolute apoplexy amongst Springbok supporters, particularly, obviously, white South Africans, then ruling the roost under apartheid. And they turned on me as a former Pretoria boy and called me all those things and public enemy number one. But I think it was the idea of stopping the Springboks, omnipotent on the international uh, fields of the world at the time, uh, actually stopping them playing and then leading to the stopping of the 1970 cricket tour due to come to England that propelled white South Africa into sporting isolation through direct action. And uh, that's why they, they, they hated me, as they repeatedly said, the apartheid supporting white community. So uh, I suppose those that don't take the an interest in history it may not have an appreciation of the significance of those two words, direct action, and the, as well as the achievement of disrupting the, this uh, rugby tour on the one hand, and ultimately leading up to the cancellation of the cricket tour in 1970. So I wonder if you could reflect uh, very quickly before I, I, we can come back to this, and, 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 and then I come back to, I'll, I'll switch over to Andre in a second. If you could reflect for you the role that you played as a young man of 19 and later 20, and, and, and what you hoped to achieve when you were involved uh, in, 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 in sports activism at, the, at, the, at, at that stage. Well, the British anti-apartheid movement, which was the most powerful in the world, had followed uh, Albert Latouli's call for the international community to take up activism against apartheid and impose sanctions. And I was, I was a young guy amidst thousands of people who right across the country were inspired to take this direct action. And it was a particular period, Morris, that I think you're asking me to explain. You remember that the year before in 1968, students in Paris had taken over the city. There was uh, direct action occupations of universities in the United States protesting about uh, social justice. And it, it was in a long tradition, Gandhi uh, in America, in Indian independence adopted nonviolent direct action. Uh, so did the suffragettes campaigning for votes for women in Britain. Votes for women didn't arrive through the British Parliament sort of voluntarily. It was only a struggle by women in Britain. And it was in that tradition. And of course, in South Africa in the 50s, um, Nelson Mandela and Walter Sisulu and all the other leaders and Oliver Tambo, leaders of the ANC, led nonviolent direct action through rent strikes and, uh, and other and stay at homes and so on. Um, so it was in that kind of tradition that we introduced into sport. Nothing had ever, nothing like that had ever happened to sport before. It was regarded as a, a sort of sanctified uh, oasis in life that you couldn't bring issues of social justice and morality, and in this case, racism, uh, onto the pitch. And, and in, even though, of course, apartheid infested its sports system with racism like no other country. I mean, I, I as a schoolboy, Andre as a schoolboy, myself in Pretoria, him in Queenstown, couldn't play sport against or with anybody who didn't have a white skin. And that went all the way up, of course, to national level in the selection of the Springboks. So, I mean, um, there are moments of humor. I'm not sure if they were meant in humor, Andre, um, when I read the book about the weapons uh, that the direct action people selected. For example, weed killer in, 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 in Oxford and um, model aeroplanes and 50,000 insects by a biology students to be released at a cricket, um, uh, on a cricket pitch. <laughs> so, I mean, these are very bizarre. I suppose mm. you, you can't, if, if, you couldn't script it, um, if mm. I can put it that way. And yet people felt we will defeat this thing apartheid, mm. even if with model airplanes or with, with insects and so forth. Um, 
what are some of the interesting things that Peter and his colleagues got involved with? I, I recall you were slightly younger than Peter at the time, around eight mm. or nine years old, according to the book, Andre. Yes, thanks. I mean, the, the big point is, uh, like the 1980s in South Africa, people under conditions of uh, oppressive conditions and, and struggling in a very serious way come up with all sorts of um, absolutely creative ways, including, of course, culture and music and things like that. But in Peter and them's case, they disrupted a hundred year old Victorian narrative about sport being somehow above, um, above society where you could, the gentleman could play at leisure in an old fashioned way. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, follow their pursuits in life kind of thing. And for ordinary people, it was a bit less rarefied. But they ruptured that thing. And it happened, as Peter said, at a time of the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, and also in, in Africa, in particular, but also elsewhere, the process of decolonization was happening. So there was a direct challenge to the old system, including how they saw themselves and how they saw their sport, uh, which was spread through colonialism to the rest of the world. And yeah. uh, these creative methods that people found, you don't know how they thought them up, obviously <laughs> come out in the book. So it's, you know, uh, paint them black and send them back. So paint yes, arms absolutely. get chucked on fields, people climbing uh, posts and, and uh, tying themselves to the posts so that they bring the game to an end. And it created, I mean, I think it was that shock of the unexpected that totally uh, made rugby front page news for that entire tour. 24 yeah. of the 25 matches were affected. And uh, Darby de Villiers, the captain said, we had it up to here pointing to his neck and we were ready to go home. And that was exactly the effect that Peter and the anti-apartheid protesters and the anti-apartheid movement wanted to create. And once that had happened and it sport instead of politely protesting with your banner outside and being ignored, sport was front page and apartheid in sport. And it became a massive public debate, front pages day after day in, in South African papers. And that is why he was called this little creep, you know, he should be <laughs> put, put upside down, uh, dipped in his head, dipped in a nasty place, preferably upside down and so on. And that kind of hate, uh, kind of public Anger showed the effectiveness of that tour because it was the 60s a decade of repression when the Rivonia trialists were on Robben Island. Thousands of PAC and ANC and other people were now stuck away and they were told literally you're going to be forgotten here. And yeah. the, this, this kept that alive. Sport became the soft underbelly at which you could get to apartheid. The international interests were so vested in the arms trade and in economic um, relations uh, stemming from the period of gold and diamonds and British control of the economy that that wasn't going to be listened to even though that was a call also at the international level at that stage. And uh, this pressure uh, had a massive impact. It also boosted an internal sports, non-racial sport movement, as it was called, that had been crushed together with a political resistance after Sharpeville. So, so before we get into the detail yeah. of that, I, I want you to reflect a little bit on hmm. you, uh, Andre. Yeah. So the, the, the numbers that I'm interested in are 34-14, um, because I think those numbers for you uh, as a little boy, were really important because they set a foundation in terms of locating you mm. in who you were as an Afrikaans boy growing yeah. up in the place, so to speak, yeah. um, and, and being part of the folk um, yeah. and, and, and what it means to be a, a CN van de folk and loving rugby. So yeah. talk to us what 3414 stands for, please, Andre. Thank you for reading it so closely. I had to think what 34 and 14 meant <laughs> until I realized it was the score of the first rugby test match I went to. So uh, my father 
uh, grew was Afrikaans speaking. All my family was Afrikaans, but we spoke English at home and I went to Queen's College. So I had a very sort of um, uh, mixed upbringing in that sense. That was because my mother had been an orphan. And so she, I had no English speaking family and rugby of course was very important. Um, to the Afrikaners uh, sort of psyche at that time, especially after 1948, when Afrikaners took over control also of the administration on rugby uh, from uh, the old uh, English colonial establishment. Uh, there's a, that's another whole story. But um, basically I grew up in the heart of, of the apartheid period um, in, a, in a school and uh, in the church and in everything that uh, surrounded me. My parents supported apartheid, um, although they taught me all the good things about, in life about being um, fair, just uh, respecting people and so on. It didn't apply to black South Africans, of course. And that's how pervasive segregation and apartheid was. And these demonstrations that created the sensation were one of my early sort of eye-openers that started making me look um, at society more broadly in, in different lenses, you know. Um, Donald Woods was also editor of the Daily Dispatch, and in South African terms, he was a, a, a liberal left kind of critic of apartheid. And so as a young person um, stuck in this small town, which was very much structured on apartheid lines, my life was like that. Um, I started getting my first alternative ideas. And eventually, I joined the non-racial sports struggle. Oh, no, we're not going to go there. We're going to yeah. stay with you in history as yeah. a young man. Yeah. So what I'm going to ask you to put up, possibly, uh, Andre, is a picture of um, a Krom, William Henry Krom Hendricks. So whilst you're putting that up, I want to switch back to you, Peter. And, and refer to a quote in the book by one of my favorite authors, um, Ellen Payton, who says, I'm, net, I'm not an all or nothing person, Peter. I'm an all or something person. Talk to us and help us to understand, Peter, how that helped shape uh, the young Peter who later became uh, this despicable human being that David Kenvin is referring to on the chat. So I'd like to invite people on the chat, uh, on the call to post their comments on the chat, uh, as well as um, if at a later stage will allow you to also engage directly with Peter and Andre. Um, so how did this advice or this comment from Ellen Payton uh, influence your thinking, Peter? Well, I met him as a small boy during the state of emergency in 1961 when um, uh, my mom and dad had to flee Pretoria where they'd been anti-apartheid activists and were traveling around the country. And uh, we went to his house and he of course was then president of the non-racial South African Liberal Party, which at the time was the only non-racial legal anti-apartheid party, the ANC, the PAC, the Communist Party, of South Africa, Congress of Democrats, all having been banned. Um, and he said this to me, and it made a big impact, actually. He was a rather gruff figure, as, as, as I recollect, as a small boy. But he said, you know, I'm, an all or, I'm not an all or nothing person. I'm an all or something person. In other words, try to achieve what you can, even if it seems uh, not everything, because that way you can make progress. And it stuck with me. And a lot of people used to say to me at the time of the Stop the Tour campaign, oh, yeah, but the big issues are economic, military alliances with apartheid South Africa. Of course they were. And I campaigned on those like other members of the British anti-apartheid movement. But here I thought with sport, we could really do something uh, at the soft underbelly of apartheid, as Andre describes it, and hit them hard. And, and being myself a white South African boy of upbringing, uh, brought up in Pretoria of anti-apartheid parents. Uh, I knew, and being sports mad myself, I knew how important it was. So in a sense, it was applying the Alan Payton uh, dictum, which I've tried to follow throughout my life, concentrating on where you can really make a difference rather than trying to do everything and ending up doing nothing. So Peter, whilst uh, 
rugby was it was and later on in our time continues to be a symbol of high society, particularly in the Afrikaans community when it comes to sports. Cricket though was not at the same level in South Africa. So what, what informed the strategy of attacking the rugby tour on the one hand and attacking the cricket tour on the other? Uh, help us to understand the logic between where, where does rugby sit, let's say in South Africa and the UK and where does cricket sit in South Africa and the UK at that time? Well, first of all, the Springbok rugby tour happened in the, in, towards the end of 1969 and into early 1970. And that preceded a cricket tour from South Africa due to arrive in May 1970. So about six months between them. And uh, what a, the background to that was that the uh, coloured South African cricketer, Cape coloured South African cricketer, Basil D'Oliveira, unable to play in his own country, and we'll probably come back to him, Morris, a yeah. very important figure in all of this. He was prevented from, he, he prevented from playing and representing his own country, so came to England and made his way up the cricket ladder and ended up playing to, for, it, for, for England in, first of all, 1966 and in the subsequent years. And he was one of the top members of the England cricket team. And then in 1968, when, when England was due to tour South Africa, he was, would have been an automatic choice because he was top of the team at that time. And they excluded him through a private deal done between the English cricket authorities and the white South African apartheid supporting cricket authorities. And it, it caused uproar. And then a player pulled out of the team and he was then subsequently selected belatedly and uh, Balthazar John Foster, the, the prime minister of South Africa at the time, canceled the tour said this is the team of the anti-apartheid movement because it included Basil D'Oliveira, who would have been very embarrassing to have touring his own country representing England and showing up the uh, iniquities of apartheid in cricket. And so they cancelled that tour. And nevertheless, within a few months, as if nothing had happened, Lord's Cricket Ground English Establishment had in, invited the South Africans, the white South Africans, to tour in 1970. And I took umbrage at this, as did others, and we thought we have to stop the cricket tour. And so that was our focus, stop the 70 tour campaign, which we formed, and I found myself chairing and leading, with Dennis Brutus, a very important figure in the struggle, Chris De Brolio as well, leading the South African Non-Racial Olympic Committee and encouraging me to do it. And that's how the origins of focusing on cricket came, but it was linked to rugby and rugby was in the, in, in, as it were, in the forefront because the Springbok tour happened first. So we'll come back to, to Basil de Oliveira. Uh, and I wonder if you could scroll back, Andre, uh, to the first of the pictures, um, uh, because I, I, I want us, I would like you to introduce us to Krom, please, because I think, uh, uh, when we talk about the Dolavira affair, that was not the beginning of talented sportsmen, uh, talented sports women being excluded. Um, it was, we can go back in history to an earlier time, to a more brutal time, uh, to a time, I suppose, where there was less accountability, where we can talk about uh, this man called Chrome. So I can tell you what I'm seeing here. We are on page 225. And I think the picture I'm looking for um, is on page 231. There we go. That's it. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think it's a, it's a good jump that you're making from talking about that tour to, to going back in history. Also in the discussion about English and Afrikaners, cricket and rugby, because what we do in this book, taking the demonstrations and the protests of, uh, since against apartheid sports since the 60s, we actually locate it in a historical context. And the origins of apartheid sport come from British colonialism. Um, uh, colonialism, uh, uh, we start one of uh, the books that I've done with saying cricket came by warship to Southern Africa. So, 
uh, with the cricket ships, the warships that docked in Cape Town was unpacked cricket kit. And out of that came uh, the spread of modern sports as we know them throughout South Africa. And at every step of the way, they went with the British Army first. They were army games and then went into schools and um, clubs and communities. And uh, from that was from 1806. And uh, the photos on this page, I'll get to Crom very quickly, show you that early tradition. Down at the bottom is the Lovedale cricket team in the 1880s and 1890s. And those were 100 British mission schools in the Eastern Cape where African students were taught British games to, to try and show them civilized standards of the British colonialists. But they took over those games and gave them their own idiom and character. So, uh, for instance, a six was called um, Zimbando Zengoma, so like the horns of a cow to show a six. And that is how our idiom, uh, our cricket became an African game as well. And uh, on the right at the bottom is the first ever football tour from South Africa to England. And it's by a team of uh, people from Bloemfontein, led by Joseph Twaii, who was also the, one of the leaders of the Orange River Colony Native Vigilance Association, which was one of the founding organizations of first the South African Native Convention in 1909 in Bloemfontein and then the formation of the ANC also in Bloemfontein. So that was a central place in South Africa where the early organizers and politically aware people emerging from these mission schools and learning the skills of the colonizers, starting newspapers and organizations and sports clubs emerged from. It's an amazing story of South African history that is so little known about. And by the 1890s, um, um, Morris, there was um, already um, the third or fourth native intertown tournament, it was called, started after the second or third white intertown tournament. Those were the days before intercolonial and interprovincial matches, uh, intertown matches started. And African sports people followed that example already and wanted to send touring teams to England. And there were players who were good enough in the Cape Colony of that time, black people could vote and they played cricket against uh, white teams at times as part of that, uh, you know, incipient idea that the Cape would become a liberal place in future and that there would be opportunity for black people. And people like Paul Grendon scored hundreds against um, um, white Kimberley town teams that played in the intertown tournament. In Ekonga, in King Williamstown, they beat the white Albert Cricket Club, for instance, and you had fantastic performances. And one of those opportunities, very few that uh, black sports people got was in 1892, when the second English tour happened. And the final test was played at Newlands in Cape Town with a boat waiting in the harbor uh, uh, you know, to leave in three days' time uh, after the tour ended. But the English beat South Africa in one and a half days. So the local um, black cricketers challenged them to a match. And uh, it was called the Malay 18, because in those days it was uh, matches against odds as well. And in this, um, in this match, it was the 22nd of the tour, um, Krom Hendricks... Uh, basically uh, let the guy who scored a century in the game the day before uh, retire hurt hitting him on the hand and basically caused extreme discomfort to the English. And they said he was um, as good as he was in the bracket of the demon Spofforth, the early terror of fast bowling in international cricket, and that he must play for South Africa when they come over in 1894 because of his quality of his play. Um, his colleague, Lamar Samsudin, scored 55 against the English in that game, which was one of only three half centuries in 22 matches on the tour. So already at that time, black cricketers were good enough to play for South Africa. And um, had he gone on that 1894 tour, we would have preceded the West Indies, whose first black player played the next year. 
uh, and they developed a different uh, sort of system of paternalism compared to the rigid apartheid in South Africa. And that rigid apartheid came from none other than Sir William Min Milton, who was the, one of the first cricket captains of South Africa and the chairman, and Cecil John Rhodes, of course. He was, Milton was Rhodes's private secretary. He later followed Jamison as administrator of Rhodesia, where six of the first 10 South African captains were appointed to the colonial administration, showing how closely the idea of colonialism and conquest and exclusion from club, school, and cricket uh, was taken. And those to, to play for South Africa, white South Africa in those days was almost a qualification then to be accepted in the civil service. And Crom Hendricks tried for a decade to, to play and they systematically excluded him, the English establishment of Cape Town from not only the national team, but the provincial team and then club cricket. And um, it's one of the tragedies of um, the last 100 years where people were deliberately, human talent was deliberately suppressed for political reason, leading us into a cul-de-sac. Um, that and Andre, uh, just to interrupt, it was Cecil John Rhodes, wasn't it? It was key to excluding yes, from him. Absolutely. Exactly. So, and, that's, and that's the point I'd like to just end with, uh, Morris, yeah. in terms of, you know, this notion that the English are somehow more liberal and apartheid was all the fault of the big bad Afrikaners, of course. Uh, if one looks at a class analysis of South Africa and the role of gold, diamonds, and so on, you see how the systemic nature of racism and discrimination emerged in South Africa. And uh, it was very much uh, originated in the British colonial roots, but then, ray of, you know, sort of rigidly. Um, implemented to a new level at a time when the world was going the other way from 1948 onwards. And we're still trying to uh, get rid of that, um, those ex that 100 year history of exclusion is still with us today. If you look at um, how people are marginalized still today in sport because of this structural conditions in our country. So I hope, Andre, thank you so much for that. I hope we can come back um, and, and talk about uh, the, the, the complexities that you're raising. Mm. Um, and, but one day, perhaps, we can also start a new movement to get somebody like Chrome Hendricks, a bust of his, or mm. a pavilion to be mm. named after him, particularly in Newlands, because I think it's, it's really important that the Newlands Cricket uh, Stadium, mm. it's really important that... Um, um, we recognize that it, it, history is alive. It's, 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 it's not something that is history. It is present and it is present in our minds. It's present in our prejudices. It's present in the institutional frameworks that we use to continue to make sense of the world today and to shape the future. So I, I really look forward to picking up this conversation with you and other like-minded people. Peter, there's a question from David Kenvin. Um, I, I believe you know him uh, based on the questions that he's asking. He says, it seems to me that the moral basis of the anti-apartheid movement was to say that black lives matter, even if we didn't use the phrase. Full stop. Can you say something about how STST uh, has had an effect on how the world uh, we're now uh, on, on how we see the world today? Well, first of all, David Kenvin was a key activist within the British anti apartheid movement and has attained his activism. Uh, I think there's an important question because it brings us bang up to today. The, the Stop the 70 Tour campaign and the British anti-apartheid movement was always focusing on the fact that, uh, that South Africa at that stage was run by a white minority uh, under apartheid. And yet it, we were also operating in a British society at that time, which was deeply racist. And I began to work with a lot of black British leaders, Jeff Crawford, for example, of the West Indian Standing Conference, raising issues, they joined our struggle and he became involved in the Stop the 70 Tour campaign involving the British West Indian community, uh, Afro-Caribbean community. Uh, and 
So that link between the anti-apartheid struggle and anti-racist struggles within Britain was something that began to be cemented at that time. And so that brings us to now, when actually the Black Lives Matter protests, which have exploded onto sports fields and pitches right across the world, in a way that would have been unprecedented uh, compared with what was happening half a century ago. I mean, remember when John Carlos and Tommy Smith raised their Black Power salutes at the, at the, on the Olympic um, podium, uh, brandishing their medals, uh, representing the United States of America in 1968. They were shunned and sacked and subject to terrible deprivations. Uh, now today you have um, Lewis Hamilton, a black Formula One driver, serial world champion, leading the campaign for uh, Black Lives Matter within motor racing, uh, Raheem Sterling, the Manchester City and England star, speaking out within, within soccer, within football in Britain and globally, and others right across the world. Megan Rapinoe speaking up for gender equality, she being the American soccer cap, women's captain. Those sports stars would never have spoken out when we were organizing our uh, Stop the 70 Tour campaign. There was only two prominent uh, sports people at that time who spoke out. One was John Taylor, the British Lions rugby international and Welsh captain who refused to play against the Springboks. No other rugby player of his standing did so. And the other was Mike Brearley, who subsequently became England cricket captain, who again spoke out and spoke on our Stop the 70 Tour platform at a conference in 1970, uh, shunned by the cricket establishment for so doing. So I think there's been a movement where sports people have suddenly started to recognize, at least uh, in Britain, I'm not sure this has happened in South Africa to the extent that it should have, um, but uh, in a way that they would never have done or been allowed to do. Look what happened to Tommy Smith and, and John Carlos um, uh, after their Olympic protest. So, you know, I think there's been a change, but these issues are still very live and there's still far too much racism in international sport, and that's why the Black Lives Matter movement is, in a way, historically linked to the anti-apartheid struggle in sport as well. Morris, could I just quickly add to what Peter said? Absolutely, and, and, Andrew. And say, um, in, in discussing Black Lives Matter today, uh, we need to actually look at the anti-apartheid struggles rooted within um, the massive Black South Africans um, from the 70s onwards, the emergence uh, after the banning effectively of the South African Non-Racial Committee or S SANROC, SACOS emerged in 1973 and uh, absolutely refused to be um, made part of the government's so-called reform attempts and very courageously stood up to that and by the 1980s were part of the liberation struggle in a very direct way in that last uh, upside down very harsh decade and uh, so so sport became within a very very importantly and thanks also to the international support uh, through the anti-apartheid movement was became the key factor for the future of South African sport because they were recognized by everyone right up to the UN as the authentic representatives. But those struggles became part of the decolonization kind of struggle of the 80s. And I think what Black Lives Matter coming from Roads Must Fall and so on is a second phase of that decolonization project with the goals of the of 1994 unfulfilled and structural exclusion still a reality um, people the new generation of voices came up uh, after 2015 to to raise this thing again and in many ways it does tie back to that first phase of the struggle for national sovereignty in South Africa in which sport became very important with the getting rebel tour as well that Peter spoke about in 1989 being stopped in its tracks at the very time when the pressure was being put on the club to negotiate. Thanks for that, Andre. Uh, Peter, if I can stay with you for one more question, then I'll come back to you, Andre. Um, Reese Richards says, good morning. I can see a lot of similarities with the Stop the Tour movement 
and ultimately uh, unsuccessful campaign to boycott Argentina's 1978 Football World Cup. In Argentina, domestic dissenters of the regime supported staging of the tournament as it would, have, it would give a platform of their struggles, but also because the national team represented all the people of Argentina. Did you face resistance from people in South Africa who opposed apartheid but didn't want their national team to be disrupted? I suppose as you're building on, can I add an additional layer, Peter, and ask you to reflect also on, um, on the contradictions uh, of Australia that you experienced uh, as part of your journey uh, in the in 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 your uh, uh, in your direct action campaign against cricket. So it's yes, a double layer question. I think Reese raises an important point. For example, Helen Sussman, the Progressive Party leader in the sixties and seventies, and Donald Woods, who was ultimately banned and had to flee the country, the editor of the Daily Dispatch that Andre mentioned earlier on, both liberal voices, small l liberal voices against apartheid, nevertheless opposed our campaign, partly because they didn't, they couldn't see the justification for stopping sport. Uh, and also because they, um, they didn't agree with the direct action tactics of physically stopping these matches, which helped seal South Africa's sporting uh, isolation, white South Africa's sporting isolation. So it was a very Donald uh, Woods, who subsequently became a very close friend of mine in London when he had to flee into exile, uh, he actually said that he had changed his mind in the course of his own radicalization. But yes, those uh, those people who were, you know, campaigning against apartheid, those those liberal whites, nevertheless, um, actually opposed our campaign. And on the question of Australia, there was a a, an action replay, a copycat in 1971 of what happened in 69-70 in Britain, in Australia, and I was invited over to support their campaign, where you had a Springbok tour, heavily disrupted by demonstrations, that len then led to the cancellation of a cricket tour. So the, the campaign spread internationally uh, from Britain into Australia, and meanwhile, New Zealand, uh, with the, the Maori people's question also becoming more and more important. The anti-apartheid movement um, uh, spread there too. Uh, and in Australia, I remember going to that campaign uh, and supporting the, the demonstrators in 1971 and realizing in a way that I never had before that the indigenous people of Australia, the Aboriginal people, were actually facing massive and systematic racism as they had historically since white settlers arrived from England to occupy it. Uh, Australia. Uh, and so their struggle, and I wrote a paper about it when I got back to Britain, and it caused quite a, an uproar in Australia, uh, particularly. Uh, and so you got the beginnings of fusion between Aboriginal, Indigenous Australian struggles for equality, and Maori struggles for equality in New Zealand, uh, fusing with the anti apartheid struggles as well. So it became a more general anti-racist struggle. Thank you, I hope Rhys, you're happy. Andre, I wonder if we could take a few minutes because I want to come back to a few other questions and talk about uh, the Victorian era and its mm. impact on cricket, particularly on women's cricket. And then maybe jump on to somebody called Winifred Kingswell mm. uh, from Cape Town, who started the Cape Town-based Peninsula Ladies Cricket Club and of course, maybe even reflect on clubs like the Daisies, the Ivies, and uh, the Perseverance clubs. And, yeah. and, and just reflect on um, uh, uh, the role of women in cricket and, and how it's, it's one thing for us to be talking about racial oppression and yeah. how sport has influenced the trajectory of resistance against racism. How has sport influence uh, the way we deal with gender and women in particular um, in, in society and particularly in this field of cricket. Thanks, uh, Morris. Um, the more I wrote about the racial exclusions in sport historically, uh, 
uh, the more I started picking up uh, uh, about the presence of women in cricket you know, that I was particularly looking at, going back right to the 1800s. So they were ever present, but it was a social accompaniments and uh, decorations and uh, matches for young people to find partners and something, junior, junior uh, partners in the game. So cricket was not called the gentleman's game for nothing. It was specifically defined like that at the boys' public schools in England to train them for empire as well, to work as team people, to show leadership and all that in a very masculine specific way. And, but from the beginning, women educational reformers in particular started saying, uh, we, you know, women can't just be expected to play croquet and uh, not sweat. Um, and swim in six meters of twelve cloth, um, that it's important for the women's body in childbirth. They turned the, the uh, argument around that uh, p women should be nurturers in, in the kitchen to create healthy people. But this didn't go far in that society. Um, W.G. Grace, the famous cricketer, said they are neither ladies nor cricketers when they tried to start playing in Britain. And it was very much the same in South Africa uh, that people were excluded. But Winifred Kingswell was an early suffragette as well. She fought for the vote for women. She uh, took on the Wanderers Club and resigned when they said that the women must practice at a different time so the men could use the field and so on. And it was through those struggles that women's cricket by World War I was starting to make an impact. And to end off that story, as in everything else, political power meant the growth of women's cricket. So after World War I, when women had participated in the war, the vote was extended to women. And by 1926, the w Women's Cricket Association was formed and international cricket matches started between South Africa, uh, Australia and New Zealand. And South African women wanted to be part of that. But of course, at that stage, it was white women only officially playing cricket. Um, although if you see on those photographs from the 1880s, uh, when that was taken uh, at Lovedale, uh, people were starting to play sport and the nurses on the left here um, and participate in starting croquet clubs and so on, being at sport events. And... Um, women gradually fought for their place um, in the sporting setup, but it only started happening significantly, despite the uh, cultural revolutions in Europe of the 70s, that all South African women started getting a chance only after democracy in 1994. So from three or 400 women cricketers in the 50s and 60s, uh, there are now 25,000 women and girls playing cricket in South Africa compared to 225,000 in Britain. So we've still got a long way to go, but we see our women's cricket team now coming. And that's because of the political opportunities that gave women greater freedom as well to exercise choice and to free bodies essentially. So Andrew, I'm sure JD will help us to organize another session where we can go deeper into the subject of women in cricket, women in sport because I think it's a really important conversation because just like the work of uh, yourselves and people like Peter around sport and resistance to oppression, I think there's, this is another story that remains to be delved in deeply because here we're talking about the present, the, the continued present oppression amongst women in sport. Um, so I refer to um, a quote by Nadine Godema who talks about this concept of destabilizing self, which becomes a necessary part of journeying from whiteness to humanity, which uh, I think was something that really uh, resonates with the journey you took, Andre, uh, the journey to become uh, the first uh, white person, uh, and I'm not sure how many even after that, to join a, 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 a black cricket union in South Africa. And, and so I'd like you to reflect on that and reflect on like-minded people like yourself, like the Watsons who did the same in rugby. And, and, and then as we weave out of that, um, sorry, Andre, as we weave out of that, Andre, I'm gonna ask Peter on the other hand, 
to now move into the present and, and reflect on um, uh, what he makes or what became of the Watsons later on in life um, uh, in, in present day state capture society. But we'll come back to that, Peter. Let's start with Andre Udendal in the 1980s coming back from Cambridge and making that very painful decision to transform uh, into a, 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 a this liminal space, I would rather call it, yeah. Thanks very much. I don't generally like talking too much about that. I've uh, touched on it in the book because um, Peter and I decided as friends, let us look back on the 50 years and obviously he's got a huge story to tell. And I introduced some of my story as well. And I think it works quite well. But just to put it briefly, by, by the 1970s, I, you know, going to university, I believed I was against apartheid and I was on the side of the right uh, sort of people without making any real effort sitting in my comfortable position in, at Stellenbosch University and in white society. And the more that I, 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 bec I crossed boundaries, I think, is the way that I experienced my life. And I met some uh, of the black uh, cricketers in what was called non-racial sport who were advocating the boycott and uh, had a, an, a, an, a position of not recognizing color. And once I'd done that, a gate, a door had opened and I couldn't go back into my little segregated Stellenbosch and feel comfortable that I was actually advocating for change when I knew there was another dimension to it. Also in my history writing, I read uh, the beginnings of black protest politics at a time when very little was known about it. And I read the early newspapers like Isigit and Isamakosa and Invoza Bansundu and so on. And I just was blown away by the, the young intellectuals, my age, 20, in the 20s at that stage, 100 years earlier at Lovedale, Hilltown, St. Matthews, and other places, who were playing sport, who were articulating and starting newspapers, and just, you know, it was something we didn't know about in South Africa. And I just felt that the time had come for me to actually make a stand. As the 80s came in, South Africa descended into a kind of state of civil war and sitting on the fence, I felt I needed, I wanted to make a stand, but I didn't know how to do it. So it amounted to a paradigm shift, but where do I go now to join the struggle effectively? <laughs> and eventually I went to this incredible meeting in Sochangube not knowing what to expect, the launch of a million signature campaign on my own, not knowing the place, not knowing what was happening. And I knew that I'd found my space. And of course, that amounted to not acting big as an opponent of the system, but trying to find a small niche with the people who were actually determining, determining the course of that struggle. And that to me is a paradigm shift that has enabled me to embrace change and join the struggle, embrace change, and still feel we need to go. Us as white South Africans are stuck in our silos and we can't take that step of recognizing what the system was like and making the paradigm shift to understand fully the impact and being able to acknowledge uh, what apartheid did in terms of um, the stunting of human growth and human opportunity. And if one understands that and accepts it, and I was fortunate to be uh, met with incredible generosity, both in non-racial cricket and in, and in the struggle, um, that it was the beginning of a personal liberation and a personal journey of immense richness. And by being defensive and closed, us white South Africans, uh, even today, um, are losing the opportunity to join in, in sort of freeing our country from this terrible 60% unemployment rate amongst youth and the continuation of exclusions in structural ways because we are in denial and we are still blind in many ways. Sorry, that came out uh, 
like that. It's such a big story that it's- You know, Andre, um, we, once again, we'll have another conversation with Peter and you and I, because mm. uh, time and time again, and I saw one in the last two days, uh, uh, somebody who is very dear to me, white colleague, reaching out and, and talking about uh, how can she um, feel part of South Africa when, when South Africa doesn't quite embrace her. On the one hand, expressing how uh, she acknowledges that she benefited from apartheid, but, she, she, but at the same time, the sense I was getting was that she doesn't believe there's not much she can do about that. And she's mm. confused about it and she's frustrated and so forth and so forth. And it seems to me, and she's, I'm just using her as a, a case in point, it seems to me that um, th there's still a, a place and a need for continued engagement and a conversation about uh, how our histories are still part of us and how we could either weaponize them to hurt people or we can embrace them, lean into them and help us to, to really transform not only ourselves, but those around us as well. So for, thank you for that. And I'm gonna invite you both again for another conversation. Peter, I wonder if you could reflect a bit as we've got two minutes left, uh, re reflect a bit on the Watsons and the state capture inquiry. Well, Cheeky Watson, of course, was a Springbok uh, rugby player um, who refused to play uh, for white apartheid rugby uh, in the 19, late 19, in the 1980s and was very brave. Uh, for doing that. And the Watson brothers were very active uh, in the Port Elizabeth area in campaigning for non-racial sport at a time when it was extremely hard to do so and were harassed by the apartheid state. And I was reflecting on what happened to them in terms of the whole state capture uh, story and also about another figure who's recently come into the public uh, spotlight and that's Leslie Sahume who passed recently and has been lauded for his recent contribution. But then in the 1970s, he was actually an apartheid collaborator, flown over to Britain to campaign against, to speak against me by the white cricket establishment and the apartheid elite and taken to New Zealand as well. And uh, ultimately sacked from his job at the, the World um, newspaper. Uh, so you've got these kind of, um, movements in this, this history of South Africa and of apartheid. Uh, but I, I would just um, content myself with saying about their role, the Watson brothers in the 1970s and 80s was very important in non-racial sport, especially in the Port Elizabeth area. Uh, and what's happened since, I think has been tragic. Uh, but the Leslie Sahume uh, example was going in the other way of being uh, attacked quite rightly in the 1970s for his apartheid collaborationist activity and subsequently playing an important role uh, in the new South Africa. So, you know, history moves people in all sorts of contradictory ways. That's lovely. That's a great place to end. And for those that have forgotten why we're here, it's about this book. And there are really two comments I want to make as we conclude, as I think Andre, one of the questions posed in the, in the book is, how to honor our past, preserve our culture, and celebrate our masculinity uh, without reproducing unhealthy ideas, practices, power relations, and exclusions. And I think that's a really important question. Obviously, I've paraphrased uh, because when you wrote the question you were talking to, this is the question that is plaguing liberal Afrikaans people, it's plaguing liberal white public schools in South Africa and so forth. But I'm posing this question in a contemporary setting. And I think it's a really important one for us to explore again in the future. And finally, uh, I want to conclude by saying, again, in the spirit of destabilizing self, um, uh, it, what, one of the key insights is that we need to place ourselves in the chaos embrace the chaos, embrace the mess, rather than to empathize with it. Because empathy is the enemy of action. Empathy is the enemy of direct action because empathy means you can go back, you can be critical and go back to Stellenbosch and, and your segregated Stellenbosch. Whereas 
uh, direct action encourages you to disrupt yourself. So thank you for disrupting us. And I look forward to delving deeper and studying the book even in greater detail and, 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 and continuing the journey uh, together with our students. Have a great day. Thanks very much, Morris.